Namaste. Just as when we look at a tree, to understand the tree, you have, you have to go deep into the seed, which is the beginning of the tree. For a long time, we may not see the tree. But ultimately, if the seed is there and the soil is ready, and care is taken to nurture it, nourish it, then it will bloom into a tree. So, so too with individual as well as the history of the world, we can see that it takes place at three levels. Outwardly, much of history records only the outer events. This happened, that happened and unfortunately most of the time it records events which are apparently big events. So, whenever we read a history book, we read about um, wars, kings, emperors. So, history never cares to document what was happening in the heart and mind of the common person. How was he going through life? What was he experiencing? For example, several times, uh, this is what I have said that when there was a Mughal invasion, then the British invasion, we read about Lord so and so and we read about the politicians, we read about all these things. But what was the common person going through? What happened to that anguish? What happened to those inner events? So we have an outer events behind which we have an inner event. Very often through the outer events, the inner events are being developed, which we may not see and understand. Just like when something happens in our outer life, we go through an inner psychological process. For example, the coming of the Mughals and the Western world, it challenged Indian idea, Indian thought, Indian way of life. So the inner event was a lot of inner change, adjustment, adaptation through which one had to go through because when life is not challenged, then strangely it doesn't evolve. So it has to go through that challenge. So this is the second level at which things happen. And at the third level, we see that there is a spiritual undercurrent which is running through life. And I can take this simple example. Imagine the world. If there was no Rama, Christ, Krishna, Buddha, Shrabindo and the mother, not to speak of the many, many, many vibhutis, saints, sages which have come through this world, especially in the Indian setting. What this world would have been had they not been here? Where it would have gone? Maybe to the blazes. So there are these three levels at which events take place. India has been that way unique in preserving and documenting the inmost spiritual history of the world. Of course, it is done in an Indian setting, but it has its impact all over. Today, when we look at the world, definitely these great beings have had a great impact. Buddha and Christ, definitely in the Western world. Christ himself carrying the message of Buddha and the Vaishnava Bhakti to the Western world. Buddha into the Western world. And imagine, if they were not there, humanity would be largely... Rakshasic, Asuric and maybe animal-like. So, what happens outside happens much later. The inner is the great sowing. When we look at the meeting of Mother and Shirobindo, we have to see it from that perspective. There are three levels at which this meeting takes place. There is, of course, the outer events, which are very fascinating and so much has been spoken, written about it. How the mother came for the first time looking for 1910, the mother got engaged with, got interested in India after she heard about Sri for the first time. She had seen Sri earlier. But 1910, when she came to know, she wanted to go to the land of her dreams. India was a land of her dreams. She speaks about it. And now she had the occasion and the opportunity. Eventually, in 1914, she goes there. The meeting takes place. And then there is a tremendous play of forces of all kinds to prevent their being together. So, they have to go through a period of separation. 
when the mother has to go to Paris and then to Japan. In Paris, she bears, she enters into the front line of the war. She is also managing the war, protecting Paris. There is such interesting experience of the mother and she has to protect people in Paris. She used to see in France as a white lady or a white light which was circulating over France trying to protect that area and eventually it got protected. There are very interesting stories about it. And then she goes to Japan and then of course as we know through a series of events which are interesting each in its own right, she comes to India and is with Sri Aurobindo again. So outwardly this is the, these are the facts but inwardly through this process humanity was being prepared for something. As the mother says during the war, there is a very interesting talk of her during the war where she says through the war humanity is being prepared for the new creation. The old world order was getting destroyed and having gone through that period where humanity was in a state of turmoil coming together from all over the world, what was happening before that? We had imperialistic tendencies. So there were few empires that travelled all the way and they conquered. But for the first time, the entire humanity was coming together in two camps, distant camps. On one side was a camp which believed in uh, stamping its own singular ideology on the world. On the other side which was a camp which wanted that there should be enough space and room for everything to blossom. So this was the ideology, though outwardly events and circumstances took place. And eventually we know that through the First World War and then through the Second World War, eventually the forces of retrogression. Before that, the single world ideology was winning. If you look at it, every empire stamped its way of life forcibly on whatever it conquered. So we see the Mughal Empire and you know the Ottoman Empire, the uh, Byzantine Empire and the many empires and then the Greeks, so all of them, the Mongols and then the British, they were imposing a singular ideology upon the world, a way of life which they considered superior. But this war challenged all that and then a new way of life sprang, much was destroyed, but it paved the way for the coming of democracy in the real sense. Otherwise, there were few countries which had started, but only as a seed. So this, this is one offshoot within the being of people, within the consciousness of humanity, surely there was a cry for peace, surely there was a cry to understand what life is all about. This sacrifice that took place through the war, the courage, all that went into the making or preparing mankind for the next future. But deep within, even behind all this psychology, psychological events taking place which go unnoticed, we see that the coming of Mother and Shubindo is symbolic at two levels. At one level, because the world was moving towards an age of synthesis. And that was the whole idea. The West coming to India to, or by West also, uh, let me include the Mughals, uh, all, everything came from the Western side, <laughs> apparently to loot. But it went back, looting something else, a priceless treasure, the Gita, the way of life, at least to an extent in the Western world, it a seed was sown. Uh, we don't know, probably even in the um, Mughal Empire, we know that there were kings before this extreme things came, came up. There were kings, early kings, who in the libraries Syria, in Syria and other places, though it was a Mughal Empire, still they were having Upanishads, Indian books, and they were trying to translate. We know that even Darashiko, uh, who was killed by his own brother, they were trying to translate. It was not like, okay, this is the only thing. But later on, we know what happened because that whole thing had to be destroyed. Something new had to come up. The world was divided in camps of religion and the entire thing had to go. So at one level, it was the coming together of the best in the West and the best in the East. So when we look at the mother, she represents the quintessence, essence of the Western world, not what we understand by the Western world. What we understand by the Western world is they are both. You are only centered around the body and the vital. But that's not true. If we look at the deeper strivings of the Western world, it has its own seeking. It has its own moments when it has uh, been 
had the glimpse of a greater glory. So this Western world with its quintessence where there is a seeking for the divine at the same time the Western world which wants everything to take a material shape the Western world which wants gives a great importance to humanity and human beings these are some of the things which are there in the Western world in India the divine is all human beings are there but Narayana is Oh, there are many things about human, how to conduct the affair. But in the Western world, largely it is about human, not humanitarianism. But humanity is the God we must worship. The Western world with its cry for freedom, equality, uh, all seeking a nice uh, fraternity, all seeking their roots where they can come together. So she brought all that. Along with that, all the experiences, spiritual experiences that had accumulated below the dust of the centuries. So she, the mother gathered all of them uh, because she had to now transmute these experiences. On the other hand, we see with Sri all the quintessence, the best, the highest in the East and what was the ultimate in Indian culture, its deepest strivings, its true nature, all this Sri accumulated in himself. And it's very interesting that he goes to the West and comes back and he is more Indianized than, you know, he, or if I may use the word, he brings the Western world and its things and completely adopts an Indian way of life, understanding its deepest sense. The mother is born and brought up in the West and she comes to India and she Indianizes completely. When we look at the mother's, uh, you know, one of the things which fascinates me is the mother's sari. It may sound very strange, but you know, when you look at the mother in sari, you look at the mother in salwar suit, it's so amazing. What must have gone through her? She was wearing a kimono when she was in Japan. She could have worn anything, but these two dresses come so prominently in front of us when the mother comes. So she got so completely Indianized. So she, the, it's the coming together of the West and the East. It is also the coming together of the strivings of the heart and the heights to which the mind could go. So we see in Sri Aurobindo a constant ascension, just like the Vedic Rishis, hill after hill was climbed. Whereas in the mother, we see the depths of the heart emerging, gushing forth as love, spreading over all mankind. Love in her was wider than the universe. The whole world could take refuge in her single heart. So we see their coming together symbolically. It is... It is a sign that the world is moving towards a grand synthesis. This idea of two camps, Eastern and Western, are going to go. But they cannot be brought together artificially by simply taking a way of life from here, a way of life from here and making a patchwork. These strivings will meet if we bring out the best in both and the best is always spiritual. If we bring that out, then we will see that they come together very beautifully in a very harmonious synthesis. One story which I remember, very interesting, Champaklal Ji says that the difference between uh, the way the Western world would approach and the Eastern world would approach. He doesn't use the word Eastern and Western. He says Indian and European. So he says that um, once Mother asked Pavitrada to fix something for which he had to climb on a chair. Now, this is a chair which mother used to use. So, Pavitra had no problem. He pulled the chair, he climbed over it. And Champaklalji is looking at it and he says, we in India would never do it. Because for us, it's the mother's chair on which mother is sitting. So, they have their own sense of the sacred, though it has been lost over time. But in India, we have our own sense of the sacred. And when the two come together and fuse into a harmonious synthesis, because this is where the world is going to move towards the future. And that's what is the truth of Sanatan Dharma, if you really look at it in its deep, deepest sense. Second thing which is very significant, which is of very deep, profound, occult and spiritual significance is, if we really look at uh, the play of the divine, so it's the play ultimately between uh, here we call it as Purusha and Prakriti, but it's highest, it is the Ishwar and Shakti. In between, we have Brahman and Maya. So, Brahman and Maya, Brahman is standing back and Maya is creating forms and names. In Purusha and Prakriti, we see very much the similar arrangement. But in Ishwara and Shakti, if we go back to its origin, Shakti is carrying in her heart the Ishwara. 
whom she wants to build through many forms and names. So it is that Shakti which has gone into the creation, gone into the very depths of matter, hidden herself carefully in its depth and through a process of long, complex evolution, creation has reached a point where the Shakti and the Ishwara can once again come together. And that's how I look at some of these stories. For, in, for instance, in Rama avatar, we see that they separate eventually. In Krishna avatar, they never come together. Um, Radha and Krishna never come together. Instead, we see Kali and Krishna. They are two in, you know, they are one, two bodies. So, Kali's avatar is Draupadi. But we know that that kind of dance is so uh, tremendous. That's not what uh, Sri Krishna wants. He wants a play of delight. But it doesn't happen. With Buddha and Christ, we don't even find a mention of the feminine, which is there in esoteric Christianity, in esoteric Buddhism, I suppose. It is recognized. For instance, 15th August is the day of the assumption of the Feast of Mary. And when Mother was asked, she said, of course, it is about the divinization of matter. Because what happens on that day is, Mother Mary ascends to heaven in a body. So it's about divinization of matter. So there are hints, but it is not explicitly brought out. In Indian thought also, we see there are hints, but it is not explicitly brought out. Like there are efforts like Trishanku going, trying to ascend to heaven. So there are efforts like that. But now the time has come for both these sides to come together. And this happens because Shakti that has gone far and wide, comes step by step and now she comes and once again joins the Ishwara whom she has always carried in her heart. So now the time has come for the new creation. The two are together and that's what we see epitomized in that famous, uh, the mother speaks about it when she met Sri Aurobindo. One of the things was, will it happen this time? This was a question because they have striven for it of old. And she says that Sri Aurobindo simply said yes. And she saw the supermind touch earthly time, if I may use a phrase from Savitri. So it descended, touched Sri Aurobindo's body. And it was a sign that the time has come for it to happen. So this event which has happened has a far-reaching significance. It is a sign, as the mother said, of the tangible sign of the victory over the adverse forces because they tried to keep them together uh, away and apart in all these other manifestations. The Shakti was always there but behind. So we have this uh, Vaishnava Tantra where Sri Krishna, when he needs to rest because he is so busy uh, holding the march of humanity together, where does he go? He goes to Radha. He lies down in her lap. It's there in, in uh, you know, the famous Jaydev's literature. Why? Because it's that she embodies the Ananda, stands behind. But for that Ananda, you can't imagine Sri Krishna doing what he did. As Sri Bindu says that if it was not for the divine bliss and Ananda, I would not be able to do that he, is, he has take, undertaken to do. So they are behind. But then, this time, she comes into the forefront. So this is how we can look at this event at several levels and all of them bring hope. The other interesting part of these events, why do we have to remember and commemorate? It's to once again inspire ourselves with their life. What is their life? When I look at the mother, you see, people often get, uh, when they come to, let's say, Pondicherry, they are hit by the heat, they are hit by the, especially when you come from the Western world, you are hit by the noise and even here people who are living, they want comfort, they can't understand the noise and the crowd. Now when I look at the mother coming all the way, what it would have meant for her? And not even once she says, life is difficult, what a renunciation. She didn't make a bone about coming all the way from Himalayas and living in a nice palace and call it renunciation. If there is an example of renunciation, it is here, it is here, it is here. Both Sri Aurobindo and the mother, but more so the mother. All her life she would work. They are together, they are one. But only once they would share a meal together. Just imagine that once in the entire stay together, Champaklalji notes that mother says to Sri Aurobindo, did the breakfast, I suppose I can also... Uh, have it and then she sits and has a toast this is the kind of sacrifice tyag and tapasya 
which she epitomized. Look at the way she completely, she had prepared an overmind creation and how she demolishes it at one go. Why? Because Sri has told that this is not enough. We need this, nothing short of the supermind. So we see if there is ever an example of what it means to perfectly obey the Guru and surrender oneself. It is the mother. She is the one who teaches to the disciples that in front of the Guru, you sit on the floor. Even today, many, many don't understand this. Now, people would say, now they are pictures. No, they are not pictures. They are presences. We treat them like pictures. So, she teaches that one has to be on the floor. She teaches that, you know, you don't just put your feet and in front of the master. These were uh, simple. This, she's making us, sensitizing us to the sense of the sacred. It's not about sin and uh, good and, you know, there is a kind of thought which can completely remove all these things. But she is teaching us to become aware of the sense of the sacred which the world had forgotten. And then we see that when she comes... When Shobinda says, this is not enough, this is not what we want, she completely demolishes it and starts afresh. Another thing which we see, two things in a surrender. So one is of course, is documented in her own writings. She, when she came, she had highest kind of ideas, artistic, literary, uh, culture point of view. She speaks about many of them, a new language, a new way of life. All this she has brought, <laughs> what for? So that she can create a new world. And when she sits at the feet of Sri exactly six years after Sri had the experience of Nirvana, she is six years younger also. So at the same age, she suddenly experiences all these constructions demolish. How different from the way we approach Sri and the mother with all our construction, which we want to see realized and all in the name of mother's work. But we don't know what is mother's work. Look at the mother. Completely she removes them and her whole mind becomes a vacant, empty space. And then she says, slowly the truth began to dawn, take new forms which are supple, new structures for the new creation. This is something very beautiful to learn. And when Sri was asked, what did you experience when mother came? He says, for the first time I saw surrender expressing itself so completely right down from the highest heights to the smallest cells of the body. And that's why when she wrote in that prayer for those who wish to serve the divine, she speaks about from her highest heights to the smallest cells. I am not aware of anywhere such a surrender is even spoken of. Forget about <laughs> expressing. And therefore she could say that when a disciple asked her that mother, some say that Radha lived, some say she did not. What is your take on it? <laughs> she says, surely she has lived and continues to live. So who is Radha? She epitomizes complete surrender to the divine. So this is a wonderful day to remember. Number one, the great assurance of the divine victory. She has given that assurance and we can see it's happening. Number two, that what should be a life, not the divine should fulfill my dreams, my ideas, my ideas. But he should fulfill his idea, if I may say so. His will should be fulfilled. This is the last document. Let thy will be done. Wherever things appear confusing, wherever we don't understand. Only one thing that let your will be done. And number three, what really is perfect surrender? Surrender is not complete till even breath and heartbeat are not given to the Lord. It's a lifetime sadhana. People often ask what sadhana is about. Well, sadhana is about giving oneself and giving oneself completely. So I'll close with this uh, message of 24th April, which is very interesting. One of the messages she gave on 24th April, 1956, first time she declares that the supramental world has come. People didn't know. Some people experienced something. They didn't know. Some of them asked. She said yes. But when does she declare? That's why this is day is so important because it is the day when the divine declared that the supermind is here and it's here to stay. No more. It is not touching and going. It's here to stay. So she says, 
the manifestation of the supramental upon earth is no more a promise but a living fact, a reality. So promise we see is there. People ask their mother, what do you mean by promise? She said, don't you know? It has been promised. Because she wrote in a prayer, the things that are promised shall be fulfilled. And then she modified the prayer. The things that were promised are fulfilled. So she changed it. So people ask, mother, what was the promise? She said, don't you know? It has been promised since old. Of course, we see only those surface things, but this is the promise of the Lord to creation. It is at work here. We don't know it. She says, yes, I know that you don't know it. It is at work here. And one day will come when the most blind, the most unconscious, even the most unwilling shall be obliged to recognize it. And that's what I feel are all these events that are happening. They are happening in such a way that they cannot be explained or understood by any human logic. Just as the First World War and the Second World War, especially the First World War, could not be understood by any human logic because one could not imagine that a world would be embroiled in a war over a trifle. Actually, it's a very small event if you look at it. Somebody shot someone across the border and it took the shape. So that's when the Asura acts and we cannot understand. It's confusing. But now equally we cannot understand because the divine is acting. And as I said, one of the symbols of her meeting Shurabindo is, is the shift of Shakti from Europe and the West to Asia and India. Because she came here and Mother and Shurabindo have started the nucleus here. It is a sign that the Shakti, the equation of power, the balance of power has shifted. It doesn't mean that we have to condemn or rubbish anything. Every, it's a cycle of time. There was a cycle of time when the West had to do its own bit. It did its own bit. A whole rational world. But now from the rational, it is entering into the intuitive. From the divided mental consciousness, the world is moving towards a synthesis. And from the age of religions, it is moving towards the new spiritual age of mankind, which will integrate on one side the deepest aspirations of man which East has given the longings for the divine on the other side wanting to express it in human terms and in material terms so we see that that's the road map for the future and this is the message with which we can stop the 24th April 1956 the manifestation of the supramental upon earth is no more a promise, but a living fact, a reality. It is at work here, and one day will come when the most blind, the most unconscious, even the most unwilling, shall be obliged to recognize it. Namaste.